Hi, I'm Janice Switlow, and uh, this is a segment that I'm doing post-vote on the Anishinaabe uh, Nation Government Agreement. Uh, one of the curious things has been the lack of information regarding voting outcomes. Well, actually, as it turns out, it's not a surprise because I've gone back to the agreement and it says there is no requirement to uh, publish results for the people to even be informed of the outcomes of the votes they participated in. Uh, section 15.11, as soon as practicable after the last day of the ratification vote, the ratification committee will provide, whoever that is, right, will provide a written report to the parties setting out the official results of each First Nations ratification vote. Well, remember, the party here is only the uh, Union of Ontario Indians. There's nothing requiring that um, a written report of the outcome of each ratification vote be extended to the community members themselves. So this is why we're finding there's no information, really, no official information. Now, apparently, before the vote, the parties uh, were to prepare a joint communication strategy. This is section 15.10. And on the Union of Ontario Chiefs website, before I pointed it out, um, and they changed the website, um, it indicated that where the notices of vote were published on its website, the unofficial results, as soon as they're aware of them, as soon as the uh, outcomes of the votes are, are apparent, would be published there. When I pointed out and asked, well, you know, what's the delay? Where are they? Uh, that whole section of their website, as I said, was struck. You can't even find it anymore. So, and then of course, uh, 15.12, the authorized representatives of the Anishinaabeg Nation, that's the Union, and Canada will meet within 21 days after the ratification vote to discuss any implications and any further course of action. Now, wh why is this important uh, for them to keep the results from the people, right? Let, let's not even deal with how wrong that is. Now, it's important to understand that under, uh, like if, if you had, according to this agreement, if you had a minimum of 25% plus one of the band's quote unquote eligible voters, of course, uh, because none of this has been shared, the ratification protocol, who's an eligible voter, all this kind of stuff is, is really hidden. But let's just assume that that threshold, as they call it, has been met. If the threshold was met and the vote was no, then theoretically, that should be the end of the day. Um, it's rejected. But if you don't actually have the results made available to you in your community and a vote was conducted, who's to say whether the threshold was met or not? And the danger is if they don't disclose and there's no official record of where this is, and you know, and let's Concepts of democracy, you know, toss aside, right? Concept of respect for self-determination, toss aside. Uh, one of the main issues about this whole agreement from the beginning. Anyway, uh, proceeding, the, even if you did meet the threshold, you voted no, that should be the end of the day. Experience says it tends not to be the end of the day where governments want to get these things in place. and. Um, uh, if you cannot prove that that was the threshold and it was not met, or it was indeed met, then you might find yourself into this second vote situation. For those where the, um, the minimum threshold, if you will, the 25% plus one uh, was not achieved, they're going to move forward with a second vote. Uh, only if, however, those who did show up actually uh, the majority of those who actually voted actually voted yes. Then a second, and again, how are you to know? You don't have the actual results, and you don't have the results right away. Um, all sorts of things can happen when you fail to have um, a secure ballot who, that's then properly overseen. How do we need? We don't even know how these things were counted and by whom and who's in control of the ballots. Uh, lots of things can happen in a week, for instance. Um, so, you know, uh, you could have no threshold met 
and the majority of those who did vote vote no and that should be the end of the day um, but again there's all sorts of ways they can manufacture that uh, section 15.6 of the agreement comes into play and that's notwithstanding six, section 15.5 where the minimum of 25 percent plus one is not achieved but a majority of those who voted voted yes the First Nation may call a second vote within a time frame agreed to by the parties. Not agreed to by the members, but the parties to the agreement. So that means Chief and Council aren't even involved in that. Uh, a, where there are more yes votes than no votes in the second vote, the First Nation is deemed to have ratified. So there's no minimum requirement of turnout on the second vote. So you can imagine if people don't know the vote's taking place. You know, and chief and family show up and they all vote yes, then this thing theoretically, according to the agreement, is put in place, is ratified. Uh, and it says the ratification protocol, again, whatever that is, because it's never been disclosed, will apply to the second vote with necessary modifications as agreed to by the parties. So again, those modifications can say uh, no notice of, of meeting uh, to vote, no uh, mail-out ballots, uh, you have to come in and vote in person, you know, all sorts of ways to manipulate. Um, and it's just an absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace to treat Indigenous nationals like this. This is an example of priming, you know. Uh, I put an a, a episode out recently, priming that's basically shaping indigenous nationals to accept less than average standards even. You know, this is a constitutional change. This is abandon my nationhood, agree to have some people incorporate and control my rights. They're not rights at that point at all. Agree to come under Canada. These are fundamental constitutional principles in any society, in a condo strata, you need 75% plus one to pass a change to uh, key uh, aspects of the condo agreement arrangement between those owners that, or that use that, that share that title. And in you know, any example you look at where you're talking about constitutional change, this is absolutely disgusting. You know, to not share the ratification protocols, to not require the people to have the right to know the outcomes of the votes right at that moment, to have independent overseers reviewing the votes, having those ballots protected. We don't even know what's happened, who controlled what. Um, but yet, you know, they're going to work it, and they're going to work another way to get this in place. Well, not if I have something to say about it, and I have a lot to say about it. This is... The Queen is unable to accept a surrender on those terms. There are standards that must be met. Canadian federal governments have lowered those standards. And they're saying, oh, well, you know, it's not for us to decide. It's a matter of self-government. They're deciding. No, the people are not deciding this crap. This is a, a provincial corporation whomever uh, agreed to this standard I can only conclude is self-interested that wants this thing in place as much as anybody else. And is it any wonder the timing of the ratification vote? It was taking place right before the big meeting of Prospect Prospectors and Miners Association of Canada. And the lead negotiator for this is a member of that. And it's the, conf the convention was taking place in Toronto and there was a big uh, gathering of people um, bringing attention to that conference and saying, stay off our land, basically. Uh, you know, I suspect they were hoping to make a big, that, you know, that member who, who was a lead negotiator on this, I think he wanted to probably announce to his buddies, hey, I've done it, I've put it in place. It's a free for all, right? You're free to go prospect in mine. No, you'll only have to deal with me. So, you know, cut me my good deal. But instead, we've had no communication we had so much propaganda about this thing uh, coming up, leading up to the votes. No information, no actual agreements, just propaganda. And then, when it's done, crickets. We hear nothing, right? We, we, you know, I have heard of people not even knowing that the vote was going on, not receiving ballot. I mean, all sorts of uh, red flags on how a vote's conducted and it should not be conducted. It's all that out there. We've heard something like four communities 
where they've either not had the threshold met or if they did have the threshold met in any event, it was no. Uh, so the reason I'm putting this out here today is to say, you know, it's not over. How many times do you say no? In Indigenous uh, law, a no show means I don't agree. It, let's repeat that. When an Indigenous national does not show, they're saying I do not agree with this whole thing. Canada cannot ignore that. If a, a people are going to be changing their constitution, it's under their laws that they proceed to make that change. It's only binding on them if their protocols and their processes to which they agree to first and foremost and up front are complied with. Is there an effective binding change that will happen? You can't have a couple of people being paid by the federal government through a provincial corporation doing that for anybody. And that's all I have to say.